then a thumbs up uh, for a thumbs up would mean that your time is already uh, finished. To our discussants, 15 minutes, uh, five minutes, and two minutes signal will be uh, given to you. So, for our first session this morning, the new globalization and its challenges, implications for Mindanao, I am honored to introduce to you our moderator who is also known as Sir Mayong, a professor at the Department of Sociology of MSU General Santos City, who teaches undergraduate sociology courses, as well as graduate courses in public administration, sustainable development, and Philippine studies. He is a son of Mindanao and actively involved in peace initiatives in the Southern Philippines currently a member of the independent decommissioning body tasked to oversee the decommissioning of combatants and weapons of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. He holds a PhD in international cooperation studies from the Nagoya University in Japan and a master's in sociology at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. He is an international research fellow at the Graduate School of Sociology at the University of Tokyo, Japan. He took up graduate studies in comparative culture with specialization in international economics and development studies at Sophia University in Tokyo, Japan. He is currently the president of the Philippine Sociological Society and a trustee of the Philippine Social Science Council. Ladies and gentlemen, our moderator, Professor Mayong J. Aguha. A round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Shira. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Our greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. May I now ask our two main speakers to join me here on stage before I formally introduce them to all of you. And uh, while we'll be talking of globalization today, we'll focus it also about Mindanao. I think a lot has been said about Mindanao, but to remind us whether we are a land of promise or a land of unfulfilled promises, may I bring for short uh, rendition the MSU Quran, just to remind us where we are and where we want to go as Mindanaoans.
you very much, MSU Kural. Our first session is the new globalization. Our first session is on the new globalization and its challenges, its implication to Mindanao. As I mentioned earlier, Mindanao is a land of promise. It's also a land of unfulfilled promises. Our first speaker this morning will talk on understanding the new globalization implications for the Philippines. Since Columbus, Vasco de Gama, Magellan started globalization, but globalization has transformed itself. And the question for us is how do we take advantage of this ongoing trend? Our first speaker is a senior research fellow of the Philippine Institute of Development Studies, or PIDS. He conducts policy research for the Philippine government, particularly in agricultural policy. He has authored numerous published research papers and co-edited four books on the economics of agriculture and natural resources, rural development, food security, international trade, and the macroeconomy. He has also provided technical assistance to the government agencies in Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and other Asian bodies, while consulting for international donor agencies. Previously, he was assistant professor at Ateneo de Manila University and the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. He obtained his PhD from the University of the Philippines School of Economics in 2000 and did postdoctoral research at the World Fish Center in Penang, Malaysia. In 2017, he was the UP Los Baños College of Economics and Management Outstanding Alumnus for Economics and Public Policy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ruelano Briones of the PIDS. Thank you for that warm welcome. Mayung Buntag. Thank you for the uh, organizers uh, and the sponsors um, for this invitation to be able to talk about the theme. It's quite, a, quite, a, quite an honor to be able to give this talk. Um, a while ago, uh, in the rousing speech by the secretary, he mentioned, may panahon pala na hindi natin alam masyado yung salitang globalization. Ngayon, this is a room full of uh, highly educated people. Uh, and I think you have some degree of familiarity with globalization. What comes to mind? Is it something that happened long time ago? Nabanggit nga, no? uh, since sila ano pa, uh, the ancient civilizations traveling all over the world. And then lately, yung mga European navigators eventually finding their way to the Philippines and <laughs> spreading Christianity here. Even though in this area of the world, Muslim missionaries had already gone several centuries ahead, di ba? So, and then finally, there's this uh, meeting of the civilizations uh, in, in the Philippines. So, mukhang matagal na ito, and it's something gradual, expanding, and so on and so forth. But actually, there's a school of thought that says, this is coming in waves. So, with this uh, entry point in waves, we can imagine that we are in a new wave, kaya natin natawag na, Globalization. Ilang kaya yung waves na yan? Sampo? Tatlo? Lima? Oh, sige, I'll, I'll tell you in a while. But before that, uh, I'll be citing some figures, statistics, uh, references. Na I know you're all excellent scholars. And therefore, if, you're, if you really want to check whether what I'm saying is uh, properly referenced and documented, we have a discussion paper from which this talk is uh, drawn. It's a PIDS discussion paper. The link is there for you to be able to download. Um, by the way, all of the research outputs of the PIDS are uh, freely downloadable once they have cleared our, uh, our approval process. So this is uh, a public good. We'll be talking about public goods in a while, no? Public good paid by you, the Filipino taxpayer. So please enjoy the benefits of uh, the Institute's uh, research. So there, there's at least one wave. In fact, it's not even as ancient. It's quite around, we trace the first wave around the 19th century. Something very different is happening compared to the old navigations of uh, long ago. What happened in the 19th century? New technology. So, dyan natin trace yung first wave. Steamships. So, halip na 
hangin lang ang propelling the, 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 the great uh, ships, now you have fossil fuel power, uh, uh, energy from, the, from, from fossil fuels. On land, railways naman, okay? So if you look at statistics, some estimates go from 6% of GDP, uh, uh, yun yung size ng world trade, all the way up to more than double, 14%, right around the First World War. So this is how we date the first globalization. Unfortunately, we know what happened. That's why it got ended <laughs> in the First World War, because, yeah, it was a world war. So instead of being uh, continuing to expand trade and international relations, uh, the nations of the world, many of them at least, decided to go to war with each other and engage in conflict, something that we... Uh, we really hope will will be avoided, and at the end of that war, nations really did think uh, that we will avoid it. But it turns out that in just a few decades, they got embroiled in an even bigger war, uh, spanning even greater parts of the world, including uh, here in the Pacific, especially, and of course uh, the Philippines. The Philippines was not a, a part of the First World War, right? But we were very much a part of the Second. So that's the first wave. So the second wave, you can guess, uh, after the end of that Second World War, uh, is immediately after that, you have the period of anong nangyayari after, usually after a war and in times of peace. Diba? So, iniisip natin, dapat ito mangyari sa Bangsamoro. Rebuilding, right? So, we have the post-war recovery where you saw a reinvigorated expansion of world trade. Kasi dapat tinatagalog na lang eh. Uh, despite the chill of, so, wala nang hot war, di ba? Katatapos lang. Cold war naman. So, despite that, tuloy pa rin yung nagkaroon ng United Nations. Nagkaroon ng General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, 1947. So, dyan nagsimula. <laughs> yan, dyan yung kapanganakan ng WTO ngayon, no? Ngayon, sa halip na steamships, now you have petrol-powered boats and even later, nuclear-powered submarines. Okay, so nag yung technology for transportation. Tapos yung cargo, hindi na lang sa mga bangka or bapor, nandun na rin sa mga aeroplano, jet travel. And even people travel jets. So if before, it was just the military that used all of these uh, airplanes and jets. Now it's ordinary people and even cargo. Uh, so all of these technological improvements caused this second wave of globalization together with the institutional changes because of the uh, renewed push for global cooperation. Third wave, di pa ito yung wave natin ngayon, okay? Third wave is, so we said that there was a Cold War. Even that came to an end, in a way, with the collapse of the former Soviet Union. Round about the same time, yung technology umabanti uli. So beyond uh, the, the automobiles, beyond the... Uh, the, the, the ships and the jet planes, there became here, this one, the digital technology. Although at that time, siyempre wala pang ganito, no? Uh, at that time, it's is, is just uh, regular telecommunications. But then, doon na rin nanganak yung initial email sometime in the late 80s. Yung 90s naman, nagkaroon ng uh, the birth of the internet. So kung naalala ninyo, meron pang Netscape noon. So yung mga hindi makaalala ng Netscape, oh, alam nyo na yung <laughs> generation nyo, uh, you're born, yeah, fairly recently compared to people like me. So the birth of digital technologies, and then the GATT graduated into the WTO in 1995, to which the Philippines acceded, and now we have all of these, <laughs> uh, uh, all of these, um, say, tortured uh, debates now related to tarification, which the Secretary discussed, no? If you look at world trade, and I'll show you statistics in a while, talagang bigla dito even more, uh, even after more than the, uh, after the Second World War, after the end of the Cold War, talagang bumilis yung paggrow ng world trade, reaching one fifth, uh, one half of global GDP, ang size non by 2000. Imagine, so all of the production of all the countries in the world, uh, katumbas non kalahate in terms of what goods move across borders. That's really, really large. One-fifth of that GDP, so about uh, ano yun, mga one-half or so, of the world trade, or a little bit less, is not actually final goods. So before, when we think of world trade, ah, yung, 
yung 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 car from from Japan i export dito. Actually, the car from Japan never gets here. <laughs> it's the car in its final assembled form, possibly assembled in Thailand or Vietnam. But in fact, that car, before that gets assembled, some of the parts came from Philippines. So nung nabaha yung Thailand, way back in 2011 yata, some factories in uh, Santa Rosa, Binyan, had to stop operations kasi wala silang map mapadala ng kanilang parts. So we have integrated global value chains with lots of trade and intermediate goods. So this is the so-called global value chain. At this time, there was a huge fall in poverty. The single biggest uh, decline and perhaps improvement in the welfare, the physical well-being of the human race happened in this period between 1981 to 2005. So this brings me to the reflection of uh, uh, our chancellor uh, in his welcome remarks. Na talagang ito yung nag-invigorate ng Western ideals. They were, they were very triumphant. You would even hear that famous title, The End, ano? the end of History, by the political scientist Francis Fukuyama. Wow, history already ended, so what, what are we doing now? <laughs> In fact, that title was quite audacious. The End of History and the Last Man that was supposed to accompany this third wave. So very optimistic, very upbeat. When the Philippines uh, started this era of policy reform, way back in the restoration of democracy, late 80s, uh, early 90s, this was the world at that time. So all of our policies were designed. So inangkla natin, halimbawa, dun sa globalization, dun sa WTO, pumasok tayo, and all of these things. No? So if you look at where we are now, it seems that after how many years? 1990s. Uh, 20 years after that, it's now even a different world of globalization. It's not as triumphant. It's, not, it's a bit more humbled, I think. Because now we realize it's a world of uncertainty. It's a world of volatility. It's a world of complexity. I think our speakers already mentioned this. So given this kind of world, which I will elaborate in a few minutes, uh, are, are the assumptions of our policy reforms in the 90s still valid? Or sh is there a rethinking in order? Ano ba itong main features ng new globalization? Yung restructuring ng global trade? Nangyayari na yon pero mas lalo pang nangyari in, in the more recent decades, especially since 2008. Inequality. Yung dati, okay, all we need is, nab nabanggit nga, no? Ja sabi ni uh, uh, mayor's representative a while ago, this councilor, she said that uh, oh, all we need is more globalization and inequality will uh, fall naturally. That's not entirely true, as I will show in a while. International cooperation in the provision of global public goods, I'll give the examples in a while, uh, have, been, uh, have been weakening, uh, especially with the rise of very uh, brash and abrasive uh, leaders who actually are not keen on maintaining international cooperation. But it's not just a function of the leadership. It's actually the populace who voted them. It's half of Britain that said, ayon na namin sa Brexit. Yan ang isang example ng undermining international cooperation. And finally, beneath all that, simmering underneath is mga growing social resentment and weakening of cohesion, social cohesion and trust. We also mentioned that technology has also changed here. This is all part of the global trade restructuring and all of these things. Last year's theme was the fourth industrial revolution. We are in the midst of it now. The, this is one of the major drivers of the new globalization. And actually, if you look, it's actually implicated in all of these four features. Consider the restructuring of global trade. So this gets me another 30 seconds. Ayun. <laughs> okay. So this is the world trend. And you can really see, as, as I said, after the war, it starts to sl climb slowly and keep on climbing as a share of our world GDP, reaching just a little under 30%, right around the time of the financial crisis. Ito yung Pilipinas. Ganun din, medyo slow din ang increase. Noong pumasok yung third wave, 1990s, dun bumulusok yung uh, export to GDP ratio. Dun talagang nag-globalize nag yung economy ng Pilipinas. But look, it collapsed sometime after that. Ganun din, yung, hindi naman nag-collapse yung sa world, pero malaki din yung drop. So something is really different with today's type of globalization. 
Part of that initial phase of global trade expansion was this dramatic decline in trade costs. So yung nabanggit ko mga technologies, even the uh, invention of the container, such a simple idea, no high tech involved, just trade through big metal boxes in standardized format called containers, that was a huge um, uh, reduction in logistics cost of global trade. Now with the new globalization, hindi lang goods ang tinitrade that you can put in boxes. Now even services are being traded. And if, even if you look at the goods that are being traded, a large part of the trade is actually in the form of services inputs. So Apple, it's always been famously claimed, n has no single factory in the world. It contracts factories to produce basically all of the physical goods. Anong input niya? Yung intellectual property niya, uh, the design, the, uh, the technology that goes into that. It owns the patent and owns the copyright. It, it licenses the technology to its, sub, uh, to its contractors. That's how global trade looks like now. Under the fourth industrial revolution, we have even, we're looking forward to even greater changes. Ngayon, sa halip na one part produced in one country, another part produced in another country, we have the possibility now of one 3D printer producing everything. So baka bumalik yung consolidation of value chains back to a, simple, a more simple uh, um, setup. On the other hand, baka naman mag-push ulit sa globalization of trade yung Internet of Things. So instead of you know just accessing the Internet through our devices, gadgets, things, this clicker, <coughs> this projector, they could all be linked in the Internet and all under an automated system that can dramatically reduce uh, all kinds of transaction costs and logistics costs. So, uh, yung security of transactions, secu uh, affirming the identity of people, making sure that, you know, artificial currencies are credible and work, it all depends on digitalization and blockchain technologies that are soon definitely going to transform the way we deal with each other, even uh, transforming them now. And finally, of course, e-commerce, nagiging uso no ngayon, papansin natin, this is actually a big threat to the brick, brick and mortar, so they're also investing in their own e-commerce. And soon there will be even more features that will uh, expand the growth of these uh, uh, types of uh, uh, platforms. All right. Now, another feature, important feature of global trade is the fact that the cooperation arrangements that undergirded its years of growth, decades of growth, they're now under threat. Of course, we know the trade war between the China and the U.S. We know that now, mas now also yung protectionist strategies and es escaping global arrangements like the EU compared to before. United States doesn't want to join the, uh, didn't join the Paris Agreement, which we need to achieve cooperation in greenhouse gas emissions, which many scientists say the, 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 the prospect of climate change is the biggest threat to humanity in the coming decades. No kidding. This is really what the scientists say. Although all of this may represent, at least for the trade side, an opportunity for countries like ASEAN to step into the gap left by the fraying of international relations, say, with traditional trading partners like China and U.S. Another feature is global inequality. Uh, in one sense, improving, especially with the rise of China and India. I told you this is the biggest gain in, against poverty, the biggest reduction of poverty the world has ever seen. But from another perspective, if you look at by region, so not the whole world, you know, with China, India pushing global inequality trends, but region by region, iba yung kwento. If you look at, say, U.S. and Canada, the top 10% get two-thirds of the growth since 1988 to 2008. <coughs> so no wonder a lot of uh, even pe people in rich countries, hindi lang naman sila lahat talagang mayaman dun eh. Meron din silang levels Yung mga mahihirap, relatively mahirap sa context nila, they really feel left out. And these are some of the statistics that suggest uh, the reason why. Uh, not less pronounced but similar trend, big share being captured of growth in Europe, even in China, although there's a bigger middle class share in China in terms of world growth. Uh, Russia, actually, the bottom 50% have totally lost out in, in Russia. So this is all the source of great degrees of uh, global resentment 
and the erosion of trust. Why was there a growing inequality? Well, there are various reasons that were uh, propounded in the literature. Ito yung lumalabas na reasons, deregulation of labor markets. When you uh, remove usual controls on labor like minimum wages, this is actually, globally speaking, one driver of inequality. Of course, technological change, the disruption due to technology, old jobs vanishing. Maybe those who are in those old jobs could not really graduate to the new jobs, a more lucrative jobs after the technological change. Financial deepening also is also implicated in the OECD. Uh, it's the new technologies that more are more important factor. I also ha like to highlight that in a world of emerging new giants, there's also a big, uh, big factor from lack of competition and the exercise of market power behind these global inequalities. Let's apply this to the Philippines. Mabuti na lang dito tayo medyo abante. Our inequality has been improving. So by various measures, even poverty has been falling. The problem is it's not falling fast enough. If you compare it, say, to Vietnam uh, or even China, uh, our rate of pace of poverty reduction has been very slow. Although, interestingly, inequality in China has grown dramatically uh, after their period of uh, uh, pre-market reforms. All right, the international cooperation, hindi lang sa trade, kundi rin sa global public goods, as I mentioned, yung environment. Health, okay, so, nabanggit din kanina, it turns out confirmed, annual swine uh, flu pala yun. So, uh, I'm sure Secretary Pinyol will not envy <laughs> the, the, the huge catast catastrophic implications of that for the new Secretary Dar. Now he'll be the one dealing with that. Hopefully, dun pa lang, ma-check na. Pero kung kumalat yan, and if it reaches the, the, the extent that it happens in China or Vietnam, it's really a big, huge blow because that's a 100% mortality disease for our swine industry. So, all of this is, none, this, this, this virus didn't come from here. Uh, so, human health, ganun din. Now, it turns out in another talk, some, some, uh, in a press conference we had in Quezon City when we rolled out the Development Policy Research Month, one of the speakers, the director of the National Health Immunization, salit na tayo yung tumanggap ng virus, tayo pala yung naging source ng virus for <laughs> other countries, especially with this measles epidemic. So, we have a part to play in our being member of the global community in terms of uh, 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 controlling these transboundary diseases. Social justice, kung countries do not favor international dispute settlement, this could be, if they, they don't prop it up, we could be in trouble because this could be, uh, if, if you don't have an outlet through peaceful international means, there may be non-peaceful means that some countries might resort to. All right, so I think we can, uh, here are some, some statistics about our contributions to the UN. More on that same theme. Let's just have the last which is trust and social cohesion. Why is this important? It's not just how we interact with each other. How we interact with each other has economic implications. Kung, if you look at the, uh, the percent of people who say that you know, they trust other people versus global per capita GDP, there's something of an upward slope. Okay? There are some countries way above that, so mas trustworthy, pero mas trusting, pero mababang GDP. Marami ring bansa na baliktad. Mababa yung trust sa society, pero medyo uh, mataas yung GDP. Nasaan ang Pilipinas? Mababa pareho. Mababa ang trust, mababa din ang GDP. So, yan ang situation natin ngayon. Paano tayo mag adjust sa ganyan? Okay. So, dati kasi akala natin, again, the triumphalism of the third wave, the more we expose people with to other nationalities, yung mga Filipino, marami ng OFW, the more they will learn to be have cosmopolitan outlook, global outlook. Hindi pala. Instead, many per people have turned away. Uh, instead of getting the good information from the internet, they get the wrong information. Instead of getting the good ideas, the good values, they get the wrong ideas. They get recruited in all kinds of extremist ideologies. A lot of them find their recruitment ground through the internet. <coughs> so this is really... Uh, uh, a big issue with uh, social media now, with the global reach of hate groups, the ISIS, and all of these uh, misinformation. Yung mga anti-vaxxers have been implicated uh, in the sharp drop in the av average Filipinos' confidence in immunization. 
Yan, saan ba sila nanggaling? Wala naman likas na anti-vaxxer dito. Nanggaling lahat yan sa US and Britain. No? All right. So, last few minutes, last few slides, implications for the Philippines. For our global restructuring of trade, dapat ma, ma, ano, masabayan natin yung pag-strengthen ng digital uh, trade and services. Hindi lang natin tignan yung, yung, um, yung, yung strategy natin na global value chain, kundi dapat sumabay din tayo dun sa mga simplification ng value chain. Maybe we should also look at these new manufacturing technologies and adapt to uh, the Internet of Things and new logistics. Instead of joining the trend of turning away from international cooperation arrangements, why don't we buck the trend and take the lead in strengthening international relations? Of course, on a realistic basis that honors our uh, nationalist uh, uh, sovereign stance as a nation state, no? Um, global restructuring of trade, uh, worsening global inequality. So I think we also mentioned, hinailight ng mga speakers uh, this morning, yung importance of uh, education, retraining, investing in the kind of skills that are appropriate or suitable or that will adapt and even thrive in a world of the fourth industrial revolution. In trust and social cohesion, a bit more practical. Maybe we can't let these alternative media platforms just do their own thing, but put, in, put into place some measures that will help um, uh, prevent the spread of disinformation. We're not saying that control free speech, but you know, put an alternative out there and try to uh, inculcate a more responsible type of uh, uh, policies in our uh, uh, um, social media uh, uh, companies and enterprises. Oh, one last point. I think it's important. Yung hindi lang negative, panay negative yung yung magiging role ng digital pero it this could be one way of promoting transparency. So let's say instead of having to deal with government face to face, so you write the Bureau of Corrections and then. The uh, ask for some special, that's my face-to-face -face interaction. Okay, let's have less of that. Let's have a more objective governance mediated through technology. Kasi yung computer, hopefully hindi masusuhulan. So things like this, you know, uh, uh, in a way na secure yung transaction, you can be confident that what you really, uh, the, the service that you really paid for as a tax-paying citizen uh, really is given by government and that could also all be reinforced by a trust-promoting uh, digital platform. So there are many, many measures that Philippines can do. Uh, this is at the level of the Philippines. Actually, a lot of them could also be local-level solutions. Uh, the talk of the uh, former mayor uh, already gave a glimpse of what those local solutions are. So I think with the rest of this day, we might be able to bring out more of these and have a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Briones, for unpacking to us a complex concept as globalization, but important as well for us today. And the discussion of Dr. Briones will pave the way for us to focus the issue of globalization in Mindanao. This is everybody's concerns here, here today. Our next speaker will talk on the topic inequality of opportunities among ethnic groups in Mindanao. I think the biggest challenge of Mindanao is still in the area of peace and development and how to lift the biggest number of people out of poverty. Poverty is concentrated, for example, in the island of Mindanao. Our next speaker is the first female president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, government think tank. She specializes in the field of econometrics and has conducted and published Numerous research and policy papers on poverty assessments and evaluations of social protection programs. She is also the network leader of the Community-Based Monitoring System, or CBMS, providing free technical assistance to local government units in the country in the implementation of the CBMS. The CBMS is a local poverty monitoring tool she developed under the micro-impacts of Macroeconomic Adjustment Policies Project. As an expert in poverty research, our speaker 
has been engaged as project leader and resource person in various consultancy projects of international organizations. She also served as a president of the Philippine Economic Society in 2011 and has been an advisor to various national government technical working groups on poverty monitoring and indicator system in the country since early 1990s. She is currently the chairperson of the Interagency Committee on Poverty Statistics convened by the Philippine Statistica, uh, Statistics Authority as well as the editor-in-chief of the Philippine Journal of Development, PIDS Multidisciplinary Social Science Journal that publishes policy-oriented studies and researches on development issues in the Asia-Pacific region. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Dr. Celia Reyes. So, magandang Jensan. Um, at home of the champions. Um, so, for my um, presentation, I'd like to talk more about uh, inequality of opportunities in education. This is part of a bigger paper, Inequality of Opportunities, tackling other dimensions, not just education. But I thought that for this session, um, I'll focus on education because, as has been mentioned earlier, one of the drivers of the new globalization is really the fourth industrial revolution. And for us to take advantage of the advances in modern technology, we need to have a well-educated workforce, those who can easily adjust to changes in technology. Because um, they were saying that for the millennials now, uh, unlike us where we had to work only in one agency, I've been with PIDS for over 35 years, uh, the millennials now are expected to have at to change jobs at least five times. And so they need to have that capacity to relearn, learn, relearn new things. And so education is very, very important. And so um, allow me to focus on um, inequality of opportunities in education because um, what we really wanted and has been emphasized by the secretary is we don't really just want higher growth, we want inclusive growth. Uh, we want not just higher GDP, not just that everybody will be given assistance if they're poor, but we really want everybody to participate in growth. And so it's very important that um, everybody has that um, opportunity in education so that they can um, participate in, in growth. And so, um, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the, the objectives, the methodology, key findings, and, and some concluding remarks. Um, I, I think you're all very familiar that in terms of economic growth, the Philippines, and including Mindanao, have actually been growing very well since 2012. So medio consistent, steady growth over 6% over the last um, six years. And um, consequently, the poverty rate has gone down. Um, this is in terms of poverty incidence among populations. So in 2015, it has gone down to 27.6% in, uh, in terms of the first semester estimates and has gone down to 21% based on the first semester for 2018. So while the poverty incidence has gone down, actually, the number of poor has not changed significantly. So pag tiningnan natin yung number of poor in 1991 compared to the number of poor in 2015, it has not really um, changed uh, significantly, and so um, that's actually one of the issues that we're confronted with. And um, unfortunately, five out of the six regions with high poverty rate, over 30 percent, are in Mindanao. And so that's why I, it has, I, I think everybody has been saying Mindanao has a lot of potential, but at the same time, it still faces a lot of uh, issues. And, and um, also, referring to inequality, which is the distribution of income, the country has not made significant progress in reducing inequality. Roel mentioned a little bit uh, earlier that the Gini coefficient, the, the measure of inequality has actually gone down a little bit um, over the years, but still remains very high at over higher than 0.4 um, uh, based on the latest um, data. So there are still large gaps significant disparities between the rich and the poor. 
If you look at this, there's very slow increase in the share of the poorest 20% in terms of total income. So if you look at the, is it red? Red bars, red bar, orange. Um, orange bars, um, you can see that the share to total income of the poorest 20% is not much higher than 5%. So yun lang yung share na nakukuha nung bottom 20%. And it has increased, you know, by less than one percentage uh, point in from 1991 to 2015. And if you look at the ratio of the average income of the richest 10% to the average income of the poorest 10%, um, that's the green line. Actually, it has not also um, gone down significantly during that period. So from 19, about 19%, meaning. The average income of the richest 10% is 19 times that of the average income of the poorest 10%. And based on the latest data, it's just it has gone down to only about 15%. So malaki pa rin talaga yung um, disparity. And so what we wanted to do was really to examine the inequality of educational opportunity across regions and among ethnic groups in the Philippines. Because we all recognize, I mean, many of you coming from educational institutions here, that education is one of the more effective pathways out of poverty. And we also wanted to provide some insights on how to address such inequalities. Um, just go briefly in terms of the methodology, primarily we're using tw 2000 and 2010 census of population and housing. Um, primarily because these are the only um, sources of data that includes ethnicity in the questionnaire and, and that would explain also why there's very little work using nationally representative data because um, this is not regular, regularly captured in many of the surveys being conducted by um, the Philippine Statistics uh, Authority. And we're looking at as our measure of educational outcomes, years of schooling as well as um, literacy rates. Um, I won't uh, discuss this, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but basically uh, we consulted the National Commission on Indigenous People and right now we have 182 ethno-linguistic groups of which 151 would be classified as, in, as indigenous uh, people. And um, upon consultation, we just wanted to have some large groupings because it would be very difficult to come up to present results for 182 groups. So we wanted to um, some large groupings and upon consultation with NCIP, we came up with three groups. Um, but actually the, the tabulations have been done for each of the 182 um, groups. So you have the Muslim ethnic group, um, which would cover both Muslim IPs and Muslim non-IPs. And then the non-Muslim IPs ethnic group and the non-Muslim non-IPs ethnic group. So this is just in terms of being able to group together the 182 um, ethnic groups. And I know you can't see this, but we'll share the PowerPoint, but basically just to show how the 182 groups were um, grouped together. And let me share some, some key findings for, for the Philippines. I think as we all know, the non-Muslim non-IPs this would include the Tagalog, the Warais, and so forth, dominate the population in all regions, meaning they're distributed across all the Philippines, except ARM and CAR. Um, probably I shouldn't use ARM anymore. BARM um, and CAR, uh, where BARM is home for most of the Muslims, and CAR, Cordillera Autonomous Region, is home for many non-Muslim IPs. And um, based on this, we're finding that uh, uh, by the way, this is based on data from the census of population. So whatever the respondent uh, says is his or her ethnicity, that is what is recorded. Um, and so here we find that Muslims would constitute about 5.5% of the population in 2010, non-Muslim IPs 8.6, and 86% would be non-Muslim, non-IPs. Of course, those who did not respond or who left the, that variable blank were not included in this um, classification. But before I, I, I go into that, let me just uh, remind everyone that very recently we've had some changes in our basic education curriculum. 
So whereas before we, we just had kin um, 10 years of basic education, now we have kindergarten, we have elementary, um, six years of elementary, and then junior high school for four years and two years of senior high school before we can proceed to um, the tertiary education. And what we're finding is that regions 9, 12, and BARM have the lowest net enrollment rates in elementary and secondary education in 2017. So I, I think we all know how crucial education is. So kung dito pa lang sa basic education, there are large disparities, um, then it's something that, that uh, we really need to, to focus on. And as expected, uh, elementary uh, net enrollment in ed elementary education is much higher than um, net enrollment in secondary education, primarily because kahit libre yung public schools, you still have to pay for pamasahe, baon, projects, and so forth. And also, um, especially more of the boys, they usually drop out of school to help augment family income. Also, if you look at completion rates, uh, they're also lower for regions in Mindanao, generally lower for regions in Mindanao, lowest in BARM, regions 9 and 10. Ito yung um, nagumpisa, if you look at uh, those who started, for instance, grade 1, ilan yung nakatapos ng um, elementary within the prescribed period. And so you would find, uh, you can see the number now, but um, for Philippines, pakikita nyo ba? completion rate, it's 90-something um, for elementary and much lower for secondary education. Um, in terms of cohort survival rates, ito yung nag-start ng grade 1 and then nakaabot ng grade 6. Um, again, they're, um, it's lower for secondary um, education compared to elementary education. And again, Region 9 and BARM have the lowest cohort survival rate. Um, and con and um, correspondingly, dropout rates for regions in Mindanao are higher than the national average. So highest in BARM regions 9 and 10. Um, also, TVET certification rates. We all know how important technical, uh, educational education and training is. Um, and certification is needed to be employable. Uh, the TVET certification rates in regions in Mindanao are generally lower than the national average, except for Region 11. As you will see, Region 11 tends to perform better than, than the other regions. Um, and going to literacy rates, simple and functional literary, liter literacy rates in Mindanao are generally lower than the national average. So ano yung difference ng simple and functional? Simple literacy, yun yung... Uh, ability to read and write a simple sentence. Yung um, functional, may additional requirement that they can do simple computational skills. So, mas mataas yung um, criteria for functional. And so, we can see again the disparities um, across regions, particularly for, for BARM. Um, what you're seeing here is the school participation by single year of age. And as we would expect, bumababa yung school participation uh, among older children. Um, and you will see, um, yung green would be for non-Muslim, um, non-ITs. So pinakamataas yung kanilang school participation rate. And then pinakamababa for the um, Muslim uh, ethnic groups. Um, although makikita natin na nag-improve siya over time, the, uh, the dashed lines are actually the data for the earlier year, 2000. So higher yung uh, lines, um, ano ba tawag doon? Um, ano opposite ng dashed? <laughs> um, solid, solid lines. So higher sila indicating na may improvement between 2000 and 2010. But, um, significant differences um, among the three uh, ethnic groups. And makikita natin na talagang bumabagsak yung school participation rate among older um, children. So this is just another visualization of that. Makikita natin na, for instance, if you look at average years of schooling of the population age 25 years and over, 
um, for those who are Muslim, uh, belonging to the Muslim group, ethnic group, um, the average years of schooling in 2000 was 5.5 years. It has increased to 6.1 years in 2010. Whereas for the um, non-Muslim, non-ITs, um, it's 8.3 years in 2000, and then it has gone up to 9.1 uh, years in um, 2010. And then um, you see the same pattern when you look at the literacy rate of the population. So improvement over time, but you still maintain that hierarchy in terms of um, disparity across the three regions. So um, in, in 2010, kung 98.7 ang literacy rate uh, among the uh, non-Muslim, non-ITs, it's 97.6 for the non-Muslim ITs, and then um, 85.3 for the Muslim uh, groups. Um, this is just a measure of um, inequality, you know, Siles Index and Gini coefficient. Very similar, um, two common measures of inequality, so we can opt to, for just to save on time, let's say, let's just look at the Gini coefficient. I'll walk you through. Um, the Gini coefficient, and basically what that says is it's a number that ranges from zero to one, uh, zero indicating perfect equality, and then one indicating um, perfect inequality. So the higher the number, um, hindi maganda yon. So we want a, a small number. And what we're saying is that if you look at the bottom half of the the table, the inequality in terms of years of schooling and literacy has actually gone down. So mas maganda yun, ano? bumababa yung inequality um, over time. But if you look at the within group and between group, um, you will notice that the within group number is higher. Yung within group, yun yung differences within the same ethnic group. Yung between group, when you're comparing the three, the three major groups, so what we're saying here is that what's driving the inequality, what's causing a significant portion of the inequality is not between the three major groups, but within um, the major, uh, within the major group. Um, and so within group component had largely contributed to total inequality. And if you look at the numbers, the Muslim ethnic group had the highest inequality. So within that particular group, Malaki yung differences, malaki yung um, differences in terms of years of schooling, malaki yung differences in terms of literacy rate. If you compare the different ethnic groups within that bigger group. And so IP groups like Sama Laut, Sama Bajau, and Bajau had low educational outcomes. Uh, Non-IP groups like Palawani and Maran Marau Maranao had high had higher educational outcomes. Um, I only have a few minutes, so I won't be able to go through the numbers, but basically just to show that um, yung years of schooling, which is the red, you can see na um, ang laki nung differences. So if you go to dun sa bandang kanan, I don't know if you can see the, the, ethnic, the ethnic group, um, the Samal Laut would have the lowest um, uh, years of schooling. So, ang laki nung, nung differences. And um, um, this is another measure, the Human Opportunity Index. It's basically a measure of inequality, but discounts yung differences or disparities across the groups. Um, so, it's a measure that the technical definition is actually included in the paper. I won't have time to discuss this. But basically, what um, this is showing is that there have been more equitable distribution of primary education services but there's a need for more equitable distribution of secondary education services. So, kailangan pagtuunan ng pansin. So, we were quite happy when DSWD actually listened to our recommendation to um, expand the four Ps. Dati, nakafocus lang siya sa elementary. But actually, um, remember, yung four Ps initially, they were just giving cash transfer to those children enrolled in elementary but we pointed out that really the problem is not in accessing elementary education, but the bigger problem actually is in accessing secondary education. So we were quite happy when they took note of our recommendation and expanded the four piece to, to secondary 
education. So, nandun yung, yung problema, especially now I think that we have senior high school, um, additional two years, so we're, PIDS is currently assessing that program, whether um, the poor are able to continue to senior high school despite, you know, um, government providing that, that senior high school, pero maraming issues in terms of nag-offer ba in many localities yung senior high school, na-offer ba yung track na gusto talaga nung bata. Um, so there's still so, so many issues. And the, the two minutes that I have, let me just share briefly yung, yung sa Mindanao specifically, I, I think we just wanted to show na, of course, in, in Mindanao, you would expect a higher proportion of Muslim uh, uh, ethnic group here, 21.98, uh, as compared to kanina, nakita natin around 5%. Uh, Bumabay non-Muslim, non-ITs. Um, years of schooling and literacy rate of Filipinos are generally improved in Mindanao, so basically the same pattern we've seen before, although mas maliit lang yung, yung increase. Um, total inequality for years of schooling and literacy went down. Um, so maganda yon nag-reduce yung inequality. But again, the within group inequality is actually the one that's driving this inequality. So bakit ba namin emphasize So that means that you have to look within uh, these um, groups, ethnic groups, to be able to address this inequality. So the within group component had largely contributed to total inequality in Mindanao. So kailangang tingnan, okay, aling ethnic group ba, yung Bajau, Samal, or whatever, and papano sila magagawan. And what we're saying in this um, last slide is that disparities in terms of years of schooling and literacy appear to be narrowing between 2000 and 2010, as shown by, by various inequality measures. Uh, the non-Muslim non-ITs are generally better off in terms of years of schooling and literacy. There's higher, with, higher within group inequalities exist, and inequality is highest within the Muslim group. And Filipinos had higher access to and more equitable distribution of primary education services, while lower and less equal access in terms of secondary education services. Um, and because of this, the Philippine government actually has been exerting efforts to improve access of IT groups to education. So merong programa ang Department of Education specifically catering to the IT, to the IT group. There's also a component of the four-piece, yung modified um, four-piece that caters to that. But I, I guess our main message is that kailangan pang more targeted in interventions for them, especially with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution and the new globalization, if we want them to participate in this new kind of globalization, we need to equip them with the skills, we need to invest in human capital. And that means starting with um, making sure that everybody gets quality basic education. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reyes. As has been said, unless we can capture it in numbers, we cannot change it. I think where statistics come, uh, very, very important to all of us. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, going around the ARMM, I always ask our teachers our problem of education, bakit mababa yung quality? And sabi palagi ng teacher, Sir naman, pag pumasok yung bata, hangin ang laman ng tiyan, hangin din ang nasa ulo. No. Second, Ma'am, bakit dami gumagraduate na mababa yung quality ng estudyante? Ang sagot lang ng teacher ay simple po. Ala nga naman, sir, mag-reunion kami sa klase taon-taon. Mabuti na lang daw yung bagong CHED policy ngayon ay lahat papagraduatein mo. Oo, wala. No one is left behind. But the problem is uh, may problema yung quality mo kasi kailangan lang i-graduate. No? I think those are the challenges we have in Mindanao. So I don't envy uh, Secretary Pinyon for his work of bringing uh, development in Mindanao as a secretary because it's really a tall order for him and for all of us as Mindanaoans. To share the reflections, uh, we'll, we'll be joined by discussions that we have invited for today's session. May I invite them to join us up here on stage, uh, Mr. Magdolot, I will introduce them formally later, and Dr. Villa to join our speakers here on stage to give their reflections, clarifications as well on the matters that were presented by our resource persons.
let me start with our development worker. I've known him for a long time for our peace and development work in Mindanao, starting with expose and oppose during the martial law period to expose and propose after martial law, and now is basically to undertake and pilot initiatives in bringing development and peace in Mindanao. Our first discussant is currently the president and CEO of the Mahintana Foundation Incorporated, based in Pulumulog, South Cotabato, which implements environment, livelihood, basic services, and governan pro governance programs in Region 12 and other parts of Mindanao. The foundation aids to build the capacities of community-based cooperatives, whose members include indigenous communities, Muslims, and migrant sit settlers, who are now contract growers, contractors, and service providers of the old Philippines Incorporated with a total build-up capitalization of no less than 600 million, benefiting at least 3,000 cooperative members. Additionally, the Mahintana Foundation's Health Plus Supplementary Pharmacy Program covers 10 district hospitals in South Cotabato, Sarangani, and General Santos City. Currently, the foundation is a venturing program with an EU co-founded projects for improved local governance through IT, and solar home system projects for off-grid areas in Sultan Kudarat and Sarangani province. As I've told you, our, our discussant is a practitioner in the field of development in Mindanao. He completed his Bachelor of Science in Agribusiness and his Master's in Business Administration and working now for his uh, MA in Applied Research at Ateneo de Davao University. Ladies and gentlemen, please Join me in welcoming Mr. Martiniano Magdulot, the CEO, President of the Mahintana Foundation. Doi? Thank you. Uh, mayong, mayong odto, no? But uh, anyway, uh, I also shared uh, the perspective of uh, Dr. Reyes in terms of uh, us as millennials and uh, uh, millennia and uh, millennials. You know, my, my, uh, one of my twins, uh, a 25-year-old uh, uh, daughter, uh, chartered financial analyst, just resigned uh, sa trabaho niya sa Manila because he, uh, she was pirated by uh, the uh, Canadian company, working at home and earning more than mine. I'd been working with the foundation for 26, uh, more than 26 years. Tapos, I have to travel three to four hours uh, every week. Tapos, uh, gagastos pa dito. Siya, hindi pa nakaligo. May earnings na siya. So, parang, yun talaga, yun pa sinasabing globalization. No? But uh, anyway, my, uh, my reactions and uh, reflections or sharing uh, vacillates from the presentation in terms of globalization and uh, yung inequities, uh, inequalities uh, sa Mindanao. Now, what are we going to do with uh, globalization? Our take is uh, to embrace the change and use it to our advantage. Um, but first, using uh, internet and social media, let us first be connected and interconnected. We've been implementing uh, and, uh, solar home systems in uh, Riba, Kalamansig, and, uh, and uh, uh, Palimbang areas. Pero wala pong kuryente, walang internet connection. So paano yung interconnectedness natin kung ganun ang sitwasyon? I used to joke, I'm also a member uh, representing the CSO doon sa Sok Sargent Area Development Project Board. And I always show to, to Gina, I think uh, andito si uh, Engineer, no, no. Uh, tignan mo yung... Uh, to lay sa uh, connecting Kalamansig and Libak, hapi, ma malapit na mahulog. So, pag dadaan ka, lilipat mo yung lilipat mo yung running board para makadaan ka, tapos bitbitin mo naman, and then lilipat mo doon sa, ito ba yung sinasabi nating uh, globalization and uh, competitiveness in terms of uh, sa, dito sa Mindanao? Parang kawawa tayo, no? But uh, anyway, we have to build and retool our capacities in terms of uh, using social media and uh, and uh, internet uh, applications 
So at the moment, uh, as mentioned, we have a co-funded project by uh, EU promoting ODK, yung Open Data Kit, and QLIC. These are the applications for profiling. That's why I was asking Dr. Reyes, kung meron bang updated data, kasi 2010 pa ito, baka we can make use of the CBMS data uh, gathered through the use of ODK. These are libre na mga applications na pagkatapos ng last respondents, meron ka ng consolidated data which can be used by the LGUs, the planners, and decision makers. We can also link that to the QLIC in terms of data analysis, uh, segregation, and planning purposes. Pero, palagi ko sinasabi, we have to retool. Kasi ang experience namin, mabilis yung mga younger generations, pero yung mga nasa twilight, twi twilight years ba? <laughs> yung medyo nasa ano na, mahirap at palaging bit-bit akay-akay na assistant to do the, uh, uh, the works for them. So, baka pwede nang i-retire na lang natin, uh, secretary, no? yung mga uh, hindi nakaka-adjust para naman makatipid ang gobyerno. No? <laughs> at, uh, so, it can, uh, yung sa ODK, it can be used for mapping, tax collection, project monitoring, and uh, data management analysis example that's being adopted by the province of South Cotabato as a part of the, their commitment on the open government program na yung monitoring uh, using the IT tools na available, open and uh, free. No? Doon sa mga disadvantaged uh, communities or left behind uh, GIDA communities, ang suggestion namin and based on our experience, baka kailangan lang long-term, comprehensive, integrated development approach. Uh, we adopted uh, a community of demobilized uh, MNLF combatants, 150 households, 56 uh, uh, armed men. We adopted them for 11 years, spent 25 million. Pero after 11 years, 25 million, yung dumaan lang sa amin as Mahintana Foundation, wala pa yung ibang donors and uh, the LGU. But after 11 years, nagiging mainstream sila and they are now earning, no? uh, not maybe sufficiently to, to support their family or respective families. Ang problema sa atin sa Mindanao, we are always beholden doon sa mga donors and we are project driven. Pag mayroong funding ang international in, uh, uh, donor, we susunod tayo doon sa policies nila instead of us harmonizing our development agenda with that of their support. Palaging nakatali sa three-year, five-year development uh, assistance. Pag nawala, walang, walang consistency. Kaya nga, ako masakit sa loob ko, palagi sinasabi, malaking pera pumunta sa BARM or sa conflict-affected areas. Pero sino ba nag implement Kung tingnan mo in terms of the distribution of the assistance, Contractor pa lang, 35 to 40% na. Tapos pababa na pababa. In fact, there's a program for basic education para sa malapatan na sinabi ay, nung kinumpute namin, 63 million ang budget per municipality. Ang bumaba lang is, I think, less than 5 million. So, doon sa hierarchy ng assistance, nawawala yung maraming tagas. Eh, sayang naman yung development opportunities. Huh? Um... In terms of productivity, in terms of productive, tapos uh, oras na ba? Wala pa. In terms of uh, productivity, I think uh, we are designed to fail. At saka yung gobyerno, I think oriented in terms of distrust or distrust. Pag, uh, pag IP ka or galing ka sa bundok, kukuha ka ng uh, passport or whatever documents, kailangan mo ng barangay clearance, police clearance, NBI clearance, and certified copy of PSA, kahit meron ka ng LCR uh, uh, document. Palaging maraming hinihingi. I tapos hingan ka pag punta ka sa bangko, two, two government issued ID. I wala ka nga si Dula, how much more pa yung ID? Diba? Hopefully, the national ID system will remove the barriers. Instead of the government, magka problema in terms of validation, it's now the burden of the citizens and the IPs, particularly the IPs and the disadvantaged areas, to prove that we are part of the Philippines. 
bakit nyo pinapasa sa amin ang problema? Bakit hindi kayo maging interconnected ang government agencies? Para kami hindi na magka-problema. Sabihin mo, oh Mr. Magdolot, oh, an anong pangalan mo? Martiniano Magdolot. Pag plus, meron na. Ito, 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 ito yung mga qualification. Rather than aantayin mo yung PSA na pakahaba-haba ng linya, tapos it's really a burden. I don't know kung yun ba talaga ang design natin to be competitive. No? But uh, in a way, tapos um, on product uh, development and competitiveness. Kini na kinakausap ko si PD uh, Gabonali sa DTI. Actually, uh, sorry secretary, hindi ko lang maintindihan kasi ang production natin and assistance sa communities are masyadong micro, walang scale, walang volume. Uh, I'm uh, working with, uh, interacting with uh, multinational corporations. Sila, kahit ang production nila, Davao, Bukidnon, South Cotabato, the bricks of the products are the same or the quality of the products are the same. Pero sa atin, coconut, cocoa sugar, ito sunog, ito, ito malagkit, ito uh, masyadong powdery. Pero kung kung natin na-develop na technology, yun nilang i-replicate natin. Baka pwede na lang na we will buy the technology as government rather than packets of assistance na wala namang patutunguhan in terms of marketability. Uh, and uh, last, sana naman when we do development planning, kasama yung community. It should, there should be ownership in terms of what do we really want? Maraming taga-barm dito. Ano ba talagang gusto natin? Pero minsan, yung consultants natin, sila nagdadala kasi mayroong hinahabol na deliverables. Oh, paraging deliverables. Uh, kami, we always argue with the donors. Sundan nyo kami. Example, there's a donor. I don't know this is true to DNR and NGP. Reforestation. Sabi niya, though your burnt rate is mabagal, mahina. Sabi ko, bakit ko naman ko papatanim? Pwede kong i-liquidate yun. E-drought, sayang naman yung tatanim natin. Baka yung development planning natin and uh, walang, walang considerations doon sa reactors on the ground. No? Uh, I think we are trained to talk, so thank you and uh, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Dudoy. Ayan po ay panaghoy ng isang development worker sa Mindanao. No, but I think these are stories from the ground for development workers who had been trying their best for years, and yet the challenges are, are really huge. Our next resource person is a solid academician. He's also an internationalist, in fact, a Japayuki. No, uh, that's how we call ourselves, uh, those who went to Japan. Uh, He's currently a faculty of the Political Science Department of the Mindanao State University, General Santos City, and our campus secretary. Got his bachelor's degree from Ateneo de Dabao in Political Science. Took up a master's degree on, on health, social science, and social research, one in Ateneo and Dilasal. Uh, hindi pa siya nakontento, nag-aral pa uli. And took his PhD at the Chumik the Chumikan Asia Pacific University in Japan under the Monbushu program of the Japanese government. And he was a visiting scholar at the Hofer Institution Library and Archives in Stanford University. He is currently a member of the Board of Trustees of the Philippine Political Science Association. And before joining MSU Jensen, he was uh, before joining MSU Jensen, he was also a faculty of Ateneo de Davao University and editor-in-chief of the ECRA Journal of al Kalam Institute under the Ateneo de Davao University. Ladies and gentlemen, may I bring to you Dr. Anderson Pilia. Thank you for the kind introduction, Sir Mayong. Uh, both of us are also, we are now karaoke because from Japan. Uh, coming to the Philippines. And uh, welcome, Secretary Pinyol. Uh, two of your, I guess, uh, yung uh, isang niece po, si uh, Steffi Pinyol. She used to, my, to be my student sa uh, Ateneo de Davao, political science. Uh, she's taking up uh, law school. And then uh, 
AJ, AJ Pinjol too, uh, passed to my uh, uh, advisory. I, so I'll just, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll give a comment uh, generally to both our uh, speakers uh, in, in three major points. And first and foremost, I would like to commend our speakers and uh, my fellow discussant for their thought-provoking presentation this morning. By listening to their lectures and discussions, it's like getting a crash course for Jack 103, Contemporary World, for our students these days. My discussions would dwell on three important points. First, in terms of the intensification of globalization, MSU in context, or Mindanao in context. Secondly, on globalization and inequality, I guess uh, the speaker, second speaker also briefly mentioned about uh, in her paper about the uh, impact of armed conflict and displacement. And lastly, this is my interest on globalization and migration. It is obvious that globalization is not a new phenomenon as presented by Dr. Briones. However, Globalization today has indeed intensified on its scope or domain, the speed and gustiness. It's like typhoon running more than 140 kilometers per hour, as our dear Chancellor would want us to achieve global competitiveness. Done years back or centuries ago, uh, scholars like Sando Guterella reiterates that the term globalization refers to the emerging of an international network uh, belonging to an economic and social system. In his book, uh, The Consequences of Modernity, Anthony Giddens defines globalization as the intensification of social relations throughout the world, linking distant localities in such a way that local happenings are formed as a result of events that occur many miles away and vice versa. If you're familiar of the word globalization, where global meets the local. If we are going to apply this definition in the context of religion, and uh, there's a book as argued by Peter van der Veer, which seems plausible that indeed there is already exist or there already existed a globalization of Christianity, if not a globalization of Islam. As mentioned by Chancellor Ali, MSU Jensen has already made a fair share in maximizing the full potential of globalization these days. As we are also internationalizing our uh, campus through academic exchanges and global linkages. And in fact, uh, our Chancellor also mentioned that a few months ago, we successfully held the first international symposium on the philosophy of Islamic education and Muslim contribution to science and development. Indeed, we, are, we also signed various memorandum of agreements and memorandum of understandings with our academic partners from Singapore, Brunei, Indonesia, and more to come from Malaysia and the Middle East, inshallah and all over the Asia. This and more are our commitments toward uh, reaching a good balance between global integration and local I initiatives. Secondly, on the question about uh, the presentation of Dr. Reyes, uh, I guess I agree with Sir, uh, our second speaker, uh, second, our discussant uh, from Sir uh, Magdolot on the need for us to update the data because I was seeing year 2000 to 2010 and I guess the next round will be 2020, right? So that we will find out a longitudinal uh, result of uh, the in inequality study. And I guess I will dwell partly on a question about um, the impact of inequality uh, these days, like for instance, there is also political and economic instability which fuels displacement and forced migration. And for instance, here in, in uh, Mindanao, 
there's a rising or emerging increasing number of migrants, both domestic and even international at the international level. However, on a positive note, there is also an intensification of moving towards cooperation and peace initiatives. And this is, uh, aside from the BARM initiative, this is also further observed in the ASEAN experience on the consensus on the protection and promotion of rights of migrant workers in 2017 last year. And I would like to connect this with uh, my last point on globalization and migration, especially in the context of increasing number of OFWs going outside of the Philippines. As we all know, over 3,000 OFWs are leaving the Philippines daily. You get to see them at the international airport, queuing up uh, at the terminal, Naia Terminal 1. And in relation to this, uh, I guess Dr. Briones partly mentioned on the, int the intensification of global value chain. And I guess this is, this is what, uh, this is I guess one of the things that, uh, that is what we call impacted uh, the people across the globe. That is in the age of modern globalization, other scholars like uh, uh, Coser and uh, Castles would call this the age of global migration. So they assert that in the core countries, uh, economic and technological changes create a new high-paid jobs that locals are willing to take, leaving migrants to pick up those low wages, low status, and insecure jobs because of lack of employment opportunities in their home countries. The global expansion of uh, capitalism simultaneously creates potential migrants in peripheral areas, areas and generates jobs in core areas that is citizens do not want because of the low wages, but migrant workers are willing to accept. For instance, uh, in the Philippines, uh, last year they issued a report, the Philippine Statistics Authority reported that roughly around 18% of OFWs left the Philippines from Mindanao, and a large chunk left from Sok Sargen, Region 12, about 5%. Indeed, globalization is considered to be one of the main drivers of mobility, both global and local. Now, this is connected to remittances. In 2004, according to the Asian Development Bank, uh, the Philippines is considered as the top three receiving country. Over $8.5 billion are sent from abroad. And this is increasing up, up till today. Thus, there is a need, and this is a good thing about uh, globalization because it's faster. As Khaled Kusser would argue that the main reason remittances have increased so rapidly in recent years is the globalization process. There are what we call treaties. Three T's, no? What I say, uh, tatlong T's, that have generated by that have been generated by globalization. At the same time, they promote remittances. One is transportation, particularly cheap air transportation. In Air Asia, they have this slogan as part of their marketing strategy: "Everyone can fly." So. This proliferated the increase of migration as well. Secondly, is the growth in tourism. Many migrants carry home money when they visit for a holiday. And obviously, we can see that, how migrants, uh, somehow they're like one day millionaire when they come back home and spend everything uh, for their families. And lastly, as mentioned also by Secretary Pinol a while ago, is the revolution in telecommunications or the digital or information communication revolution. So there is cheap telephone calls and widening internet access. So all of this, this means that migrants and their families can stay in contact more 
regularly than previously, and friends and families can request assistance more easily. So those are my three points for the presentation of, my, of the, our dear speakers, the intensification of globalization, Mindanao in context, globalization and inequality. Uh, along with this uh, inequality question, there also emerged a, an international movement towards addressing the problem, like NGOs coming here in Mindanao to address international NGOs actually are addressing not just governments, problem of inequality, and the question of globalization and the role of remittances of our OFWs. What are the ways forward? Let me cite the recent five-day visit of Her Excellency Halima Yakub. She's now here in the Philippines. As you all know, she will be in Ateneo de Davao tomorrow for a visit. I was trying to come up uh, with a possible meeting with our dear Chancellor Ali because we will be there too uh, in, on the Friday. But there, sadly, the, the Secretary said the schedule is very tight. Now, President Halima Yaku actually witnessed, uh, as we all know, his, she signed the 8th MOU, Memorandum of Understanding between Singapore and the Philippines, last uh, yesterday, covering a range of fields from education to infrastructure development. The visit commemorates the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the two countries. Now, one of the MOUs will enable education professionals from the Philippines to attend a program on teaching and learning STEM subjects. If you are familiar with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, funded by $640,000 grant from Temasek Foundation. And I guess this is where we can harness the question or the, uh, as was covered or mentioned by Dr. Re Reyes, on the need to address question about education and addressing this uh, question of inequality to inequality through, through more uh, increasing literacy rate and educational back, uh, attainment. And uh, MSU is doing our best too, to also uh, address the question on our special mandate, as we are uh, aiming towards global competitive, competitiveness or internationalization, we are also uh, mandated not to forget our special task to address the concerns of our cultural minorities, especially the indigenous peoples and our Muslim brothers and sisters. And another MOU signed by Singapore, Singapore's PUB and the Philippines Metropolitan Water Works and Sewerage System will involve collaboration in areas of water management, technology exchange, and capacity training for the next three years. We are also doing the, our part, for instance, the College of Engineering and the College of Agriculture, as well as the College of Fisheries in relation to this uh, concern on technology transfer. So in the end, together with President Duterte, the two nations, Singapore and the Philippines, agreed to cooperate in the areas of art, culture, film, and television. I guess to end my uh, discussion point, uh, here in Jensan, actually the city council has already, or the city uh, government office has already facilitated the revival of the Jensan Manano Bitung trade connection. And aside from this, we should not lose track. As mentioned by President Halima yesterday in her speech, this, all of these connections should be to further develop, to further the development of our people-to-people -people ties. In globalization, as mentioned by Secretary, it's, it's both a bane and a boon, but we should not lose track that we are connecting people too. We value interconnectedness, but at the same time, we, not, we should not forget, forget the humanity of our connection. That's it for today, and thank you for your uh, listening, for listening and participating. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Villa, for sharing your thoughts on many issues related to globalization, especially, I think, on the account of migration.
in the city of General Santos, there's a very big concern uh, about uh, youth gangs, which parents are generally OFW. Kaya ang suggestion sa local government is actually uh, to legalize guardianship of these uh, children. Kasi sino yung accountability, wala yung mga magulang. Uh -huh. um, on that note, we would like to request quickly from our resource persons to pick up some of the key points and issues that they feel they like to respond from our discussions. Then after that, we probably still have a little time a little time that we may be able to ask some questions from the audience that you would like to share with us. Then after that, uh, we'll still have an opportunity with our resource person uh, in our succeeding session. Yes, uh, may we know who would like to pick up some of the points? We have a microphone in there. Okay, let me have a crack. I appreciate the, uh, the uh, trenchant, the incisive comments from our two discussants. <coughs> Uh, ang isang pwede kong reactan dun sa the, the first one is yung the importance of participation in development. Uh, we always keep saying this, but in fact, uh, nangingibabaw yung, kasi once, excuse me, the government authorities here, once you, <laughs> you have that position, there's a tendency na yeah, in many of our authority figures, uh, they know better, right? And they will insist on what they know. And then they just impose down. And then, ano sino ba? Hindi ka naman nakapagtapos ng high school. Or nakapagtapos even ng elementary. So I, I think this is one thing that uh, NGOs, like, uh, Mahintana uh, yeah, uh, Ma 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 Mahintana, Mahintana uh, would like to change the mindset na even though they may not have studied as much as us, it's their life. It's their community. They can see what's going on. And sometimes, it's as simple as, actually, hindi namin kailangan yun eh. Kailangan namin ng hanging bridge. Yung mga ganong simple insights na uh, however much sophisticated uh, we, we cast this analysis of globalization and we have policy research, sometimes it's those simple uh, insights that are coming from people who will actually be affected. So that's uh, one, one point that uh, uh, which, which I, I can take home. Doon naman sa ano, yung emphasis on uh, migration, yes. Uh, of course, globalization is so multifaceted, so I wasn't able to amplify on every point, but certainly migration is a big, big issue there. Philippines, as, as you mentioned, is one of the leading, uh, in terms of percentage of the population, uh, sending out uh, migrant workers. So I'm wondering, uh, the, n these are, uh, co uh, many of these are on contract basis, many of them return, actually. So ano kaya, uh, instead of just capital, in terms of outlook, in terms of, you know, how they will introduce the world to their spouses, their children, their communities. I wonder what their influence is in terms of introducing uh, their exposure to the world don't, uh, back home. I don't know if somebody has already done a study on this. I think uh, this is something that uh, is an interesting, uh, having a, a look at, especially if you look at attitudes on social cohesion and trust and your attitude towards the wider world, uh, your ambassadors, as, as it were, how do they uh, are able to uh, communicate uh, that to you? I think that's very interesting and underlies a lot of uh, our attitudes. Aside from, of course, the usual media uh, exposure. Uh, so I think that's another take home I, I can get from that. Thank you very much, Dr. Briones. May we have uh, Dr. Reyes, please? Just to add quickly, no? Um, we're actually looking forward, thank you for the comments and the suggestions. I, we're really looking forward to the 2010 Census of Population and Housing, kasi nga medyo dated. But I don't think the results will change much. 2020, why? Because there are actually no targeted interventions, specifically for the ethnic groups that we have identified. And so kung wala talaga, I don't think you would expect the, the findings to change a lot. But definitely, I think um, the use of CBMS data, fortunately, um, I'm very glad that you're familiar with, with this. Because um, I think the last time I visited um, Gen San was, what, more than 10 years ago when we actually provided training to the province of Sarangani in the implementation of CBMS. So, medyo matagal na yun. Um, but I think 
Magsisibiyemes yata sila ngayon. But anyway, I, I think that's where it could come in. Ano? Yung, yung sinasabi na more um, community specific. Kasi nga, kung sabihin hindi po mapasok, I, I think just to look at the numbers, no? kung ang participation rate mo is only 24% in formal schooling, usual reaction sa central office is what? Let's build a school. When actually, pwedeng hindi yun yung dahilan kung bakit hindi nakakapasok itong particular group. And so, you need to have a better understanding. And I think that's what we're trying to do here. To have a better understanding of the local realities. Bakit ba sila hindi pumapasok? Perhaps they don't value education as much. And so, they don't think that, you know, pulling their children out of agriculture, out of the farm, and, and put them in school is better than, you know, now earning so much. So, kailangang mas maintindihan natin yun. And I think what, what I'd really like to point out is now there is an opportunity for all of us to provide, either provide inputs or formulate more um, targeted interventions. Kung ito yung mga hindi talaga nakakapag-participate in certain um, opportunities that the government provides, even yung free tuition sa tertiary, um, Ano ba yung pwedeng gawin to make sure that they're able to participate? Otherwise, yung leaving no one behind, sila yung, sila yung maiiwan forever and inequality will actually worsen over time. And siguro yung, yung isa lang in terms of migration, no, I think that's something that's very important. So papano ngayon with globalization, I think mas mabibilis yung movement ng pagbalik at pag, pag-alis. And so I think it's very important that we those who are returning are able to share whatever knowledge they have learned from outside and start, you know, setting up businesses here. Thank you very much, Dr. Reyes. Uh, yun din yung comment actually sa baba na sige man lang tagkuha o data, sir, wa may nahitabo. No? Parang palagi lang silang kinukuna ng data, pero after makuha yung data, wala nang nangyari sa data nila. But I think there's also a challenge... Uh, how do we balance participation and the bureaucratic requirements for development? Because secretaries, presidents have to go. And the new one comes and create again another demand and start again all over again. No? I think it, it's, a, it's what Dudoy was telling us na habago-bago, pabago-bago. No? Kaya hindi masyado uh, tumatakbo ng maayos yung gusto natin gawin. Nevertheless, uh, in the spirit of participation from our uh, guest in here, May we have a three-in-one system, three questions, address it to our resource persons and panel, and then we pick up the three questions, then we ask them to answer it at once. Para makatipid po tayo, and please uh, direct the question. Uh, uh, we don't have much of luxury of time for uh, longer statements than the question po. Marami salamat po. Yes, uh, we have a gentleman in here. Uh, we'll have uh, Bishop Kibedo over there. Maraming salamat, Skolmet. At uh, ito po ay address ko sa aking tokayo, si Secretary Emmanuel. Ako si Emmanuel Pontanil, dyan din po ako. Uh, ganito po kasi, uh, we are discussing yung globalizations and we would both agree na ito is to alleviate our people from poverty. I think that's the bottom line. Ngayon po, ang problema po natin ay sa implementation. Kasi walang nagmo-monitor, walang nag-impose ng accountability. At ang aking suggestion ay dapat yung ombudsman with military component at accountants ay nasa probensya para lahat ng mga projects natin mamomonitor at magawa na accountable yung mga officers na mag implement Sana po yun ang pag-isipan natin kasi yung ombudsman natin ay nasa Davao lang, covering the entire Mindanao. At saka wala pa silang prosecutory power. Kaya po yung problema natin, ang masasabi ko lang kasi itong mga legislators at ang mga leaders natin ayaw nilang mauli. Kaya wala silang ombudsman sa probensya. Ikalawa na point ko na gusto rin na-share kay Tokayo is yung shifting ng 
priority ni Presidente ngayon. Kahit ano nating globalization, sana po bigyan pansin yung poverty. Masyadong mura na po yung palay. Ang kopras, mura na masyado. Patay na po yung mga farmers. Presidente Duterte, sana gumising ka na at uh, bigyan po natin ng pansin ito. Antayin pa ba natin na aaklas ang lahat ng tao bago tayo gagalaw tulad lang sa makilala? Are we looking for that? Kasi hindi naman ideology yung mga pag-aaklas kundi yung poverty at, at uh, kawalan ng katarungan. Thank you, sir. So yun po lang ang sa akin. Sana mapagtuunan natin. Puro tayo matatali, no? Okay, patutuunan yun. Kasi if you'll be talking about academic status and everything, data, at hindi yung talagang poverty, parehas lang po ang problema. Thank you, sir. Sir, would you like to introduce yourself uh, for, for everybody to recognize? I'm, I'm Attorney V. Emanuel Pontanilla, the first product of the MSU College of Law, Marawi City. Thank you very much, Attorney Pontanilla. Then we will have uh, Bishop Quevedo, please. Cardinal Quevedo po of Cotabato. I know a little bit of uh, Kalamansig and Libak. Oh, Cardinal, sorry, Cardinal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's okay. People have called me, who are you? <laughs> um, I, the idea of globalization impresses me as uh, something like economic Darwinism. Survival of the fittest. And those who are not fit, like our poor farmers who are powerless uh, by themselves, powerless by themselves, uh, cannot compete in the global world economically unless they are united. Empower them. But the empowerment I am looking at is like uh, what one of the speakers mentioned. Uh, the Don Bosco Cooperative, uh, interested in organic farming now, rice importation. I, I think it was uh, Secretary Pinol about that. And that's in Makilala area. Why is it that, uh, uh, what do you think of the idea of co cooperatives as an empowering entity to address globalization, economic globalization? That's uh, the, the primary question. That other question is really about other side of economic globalization. There is what we call a cultural globalization. There is an emerging culture, global culture that is hitting the Philippines through media, through media, through m uh, cinema, uh, and it is uh, the uh, the cultural value of postmodernism, secularism. And that secularizing tendency is now in the Philippines and is hitting, eroding sec certain cherished values in the Philippines, religious faith, whether that faith is traditional religions of the, of, uh, the uh, indigenous peoples or Islamic faith or Christian faith. It's secularizing uh, the people Sub, uh, insidiously, subtly. What is, what is education going to do with that? Thank you very much, Cardinal Quevedo. May we know in the spirit of gender balance, because uh, we will have the next round for uh, Secretary Pinol, but before I ask Secretary Pinol, may we ask if there are any uh, women in the room that would like to raise Question or comments for the members of the panel? And the spirit of gender balance, please. If none, then may we go the direction to Secretary Pinol for his questions. Then after that, we'll bring it back to the panel. Then after the panel, we'll give the last chance to Secretary Pinol to respond because there were questions that were raised actually to Secretary Pinol. Uh, Secretary uh, Pinol, Thank please. you, uh, Professor. Quickly, I will just respond to... Uh, the concerns raised by Cardinal Quevedo about cooperativism. Yes, in fact, there's a successful story. Uh, in South Korea, they federated the farmers' cooperatives. It's called Nong Hyuk. And they literally control everything, every aspect of agriculture, from shipping to banking to supermarkets. 
pati yung uh, insurance sila may hawak nong nong yuk no? it's a one one of the successful stories sa cooperativism and they control no you know uh, ang nakikita ko lang sa Pilipinas na problema natin uh, gusto natin magkapagduelo ayaw natin gumamit ng baril no 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 really no uh, we, we try to be so open no look Japan is such a well-developed country, but it has protected its farmers. Hindi ka pwede magdala ng bigas sa Japan. Pinapakain nila sa hayop. Gusto lang nila yung round, ano, uh, yung, ano, yung uh, round grains. Ayon lang ng long grains. They comply to uh, their commitments sa WTO. They import a certain volume, but they don't distribute it. In fact, for a while, they donated it to the Philippines. South Korea also imposes strict restrictions on agricultural products. And yet, they are a member of WTO in good standing. Tayo lang sa Pilipinas ang may NFA tayo, the only government accredited, WTO accredited trading agency of the Philippines. And yet, we disarmed the NFA. We relegated and reduced its function to uh, just being a buffer stocking agency. It could have served well as a trading agency of the Philippine agriculture. It could have dealt with other commodities. Hindi lang rice dapat eh. Dapat ito yung taga-benta ng produkto natin, ito yung taga-hanap ng merkado natin, ito yung ating trading agency. Pero dahil sa isyu ng corruption daw, they wanted to disband NFA. Pabuti na lang di-retain as buffer stocking. Look, kung corruption pag-uusapan natin, hindi ang agency ang corrupt eh. Tao ang corrupt. And if that is the line of thinking that we have, then we must disband Bureau of Customs and uh, the BIR. Because those are also corrupt agencies. Yun lang naman na aking response. No? Yes, uh, Cardinal, there are uh, success stories actually. Uh, number two, yung sinasabi kanina ni uh, Tukayo, Attorney Fontanilla, uh, actually, wala ka kanina nung uh, nagsalita ako, no? uh, late ka na dumating. Eh. Pero nabanggit ko na yan, actually, yung BARM, tinitignan natin yung uh, extent ng autonomous powers ng BARM to export matured coconuts. You know, it's crazy, but there is a PD, a Marcos PD, which bans the export of matured coconuts. Yung sinabi ko kanina, on the uh, pretext that they are protecting the genetics of Philippine coconuts. But in actuality, ako ang suspects ako, it was designed to protect the oligarchs before yung mga may-ari ng coconut mills. Ayaw nila mag-export ng raw materials, kailangan dumaan sa coco mills. Ang problema natin dyan, Yung meron tayong processing plant ng mga coconuts dito, producing desiccated coconut, coconut oil, but they uh, actually use the uh, copra price as their, uh, as their uh, benchmark in spite of the fact that they're producing high-value coconut products. So the option now is to sell. At maganda ang bili. May, may taga China is uh, uh, interested to buy about 5,000 containers at about 8 to 10 pesos per nut. Uh, now, I, I wanted to ask this question because I'm excited that uh, Ma yes, uh, Dr. Celia Reyes is here. No? I have long wanted to ask this question to the think tank of government because we have discussed this in the cabinet for so many times already. Actually. And it's about four piece. Ma'am, may I ask you, honest opinion, do you really think that four piece is a good program for the Philippines? Thank you very much, Secretary Pinyon. We now bring our panelists and our uh, discussants to share their thoughts on the burning issues of the day. Please, pick up which of the issues you would like to pick up. Thank you. May media ba dito? <laughs> o tayo-tayo lang ba to? <laughs> I, I think, okay, um, if, if you don't know, the four piece has been institu institutionalized with the passage of... Um, Republic Act. I, I can't remember the number. And, and one of the provisions of the law was that PIDS would do uh, regular evaluation of the program. And I think that's, I, I'm not sure exactly how that provision came in, but probably because we had some, I personally had some questions about it. Not, I, I personally think that, and, and the evaluation have shown that it would definitely increase the participation of children. In, in school, because you, you give grants, and so, syempre, may encourage yung nanay na ipasok. But I think in terms of reducing poverty, 
yun yung issue ko dati was, uh, I don't think by itself, it can reduce poverty. Hindi siya enough um, to move the families out of poverty. And, and so, importante yung iba pang programa to be done in, 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 um, together with Four Peace, but by itself, ano siya eh, kasi investment in human capital, so pinapagraduate mo ng, at least ng high school, hindi sigurado na makakatrabaho, makakakuha siya ng magandang trabaho. I mean, you increase the, the probability that he will land a better job, pero hindi sigurado, kasi depende din sa economy. So I, I think maraming marami pang programs na nakailangan. So I, I think um, yung dati noon, kasi my issue then was, it was being touted as the poverty reduction program of the government, the, the major one. But I, I think it's not sufficient um, to do that. And I think we're, we're, um, we're, we're embarking on a study to examine whether it's really going to reduce intergenerational poverty, which is the main objective. Pero meanwhile na in agriculture, nandun yung karamihan ng ating mahihirap, kailangan pa din ng ibang interventions. Um, so, hindi ko alam kung nasatisfy yung Ma'am, let me just give you a, a uh, better perspective. Okay? I'll tell you what's happening on the ground. There are no more farm workers now. Okay? Wala, ay na magtrabaho. In fact, I would assume that Four Peace actually is now a breeding ground for mendicancy. And the amount of money that we're spending for four piece is not worth the goods that we get in return. 140 billion every year. Ang budget ng DA is only 49 billion. You know, I'm all for helping the poor. But whatever investment we have, for every peso that we in to invest, should have something productive in return. Dapat yun ang, yun ang trust. Kaya ang sabi ko nga sana noon, itweak yung four-piece program to make it a, an, you know, a livelihood program or an economic enterprise program and make the uh, beneficiaries uh, uh, productive. Kaysa antayin mo na lang sila, papilahin mo. Did you see the long lines in front of Land Bank? Did, did you hear the stories in Lanao del Sur of how the mayors and the social welfare officer hold on to the ATMs? These are the, the realities on the ground, ma'am. That's why I, I really wanted to share this with you. Because ito yung nangyayari sa baba. I've, I've been all over the country. My three years as Secretary of Agriculture. And this is in response to yung planning kanina, sabi ni Dr. Bionis, no? Actually, uh, DA under me went through a, a grassroots planning program uh, before we came up with the roadmaps. Yung biyahing bukid. Talagang umikot ako. And uh, ito yung narinig ko na feedback from, from the people. Sir, wala na kami makuhang tra trabahante. Ayun, nagtutong its. So sana ma-review natin itong programa na ito. Actually, um, I, yes, I could just yes, respond quickly. Ray, yeah. Tiningnan namin, tinitingnan namin yan kasi nga marami hong anecdotes na ganyan. And, and yung iba ho naman, hindi talaga sa hindi na nagtatrabaho, pero merong days na yung kukuha halimbawa ng, 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 allow, ng cash transfer is they won't work on those days. So definitely may, may affect. Pero yung, yung result ho nung study recently concluded, walang significant effect. But definitely ho, we will continue to work. But for me personally, to, to examine the program, but for me personally, I think we should look at it, its objective should really be to encourage families to invest in human capital, not really to reduce intergenerational poverty. Kasi kung to invest in human capital, that means ini encourage mo lang and hoping they'll find better jobs and hopefully they'll move out of poverty pero hindi mismo that by itself solves poverty. that will move people lift people out of poverty salamat po uh, may we ask uh, dr briones please for your points on uh, this matter if i may comment on farm workers um, well aside from four peace uh, recently i was in balingasag in in uh, and sorry sorry another uh, hindi, Agusan. Um, yung Lolong. Bayugan. Bayungan. Hindi, hindi. Bayugan. Hindi, hindi, hindi. Lolong. Bunawan. Bunawan. Bunawan, yes. Surveying mga agrarian reform beneficiaries. 
We were looking for them. Parang kampante kami. It was a weekday that we could interview them. We couldn't find them. We had to wait for lunchtime. Where were they? They were in a DPWH project. So they're only available lunch. They don't want to talk to us during lunch because that's their time with their family. Come back at 5 o'clock. House after house after house. Okay, let's move to another barangay. Same thing, a different <laughs> project. So actually, maybe that's another reason. It's not because they're lazy. Maybe there are simply a lot of jobs. There's simply maybe the build, build, build. Could be another reason. That's why we need institutions like PIDS to do that study. We also want to study definitely in response to the Cardinal's question on the role of cooperatives. As Secretary mentioned, may mga lugar sa mundo na na-realize nila yung potential from cooperatives. U.S. also, may mga malalaki, if you know the multinational brand of Lando Lakes, that's actually a cooperative. No, a cooperative of, started out as cooperative of American farmers. So, in Philippines, mukhang potential pa rin. So, I think that we, we should seriously look at, it, at this. Problem is we have, uh, being a co or organizing a cooperative involves compliance with a lot of regulatory standards. We're not saying these standards are wrong. We're actually saying that these are empowering standards like financial management, uh, having regular meetings, the basics of running an organization. So I think many of our farmers, instead of going it all alone, maybe there are projects that we can uh, invite them to so that they can form these cooperatives, maybe not start out as cooperatives. There's a project of the province of Palawan. They start forming associations muna, dole registered. Then maybe later, pwede silang mag-graduate as cooperatives. I think government can, can really look into uh, this kind of organizational, uh, institutional, uh, parallel basis for all of our development interventions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Briones. May we ask uh, Dr. Villa then before we end our session with uh, uh, Mr. Magdulot? Yes, uh, probably uh, briefly I will say something about inequality and the impact of globalization such that I guess since my interest is into migration, one thing that we can say that there is still a problem of poverty and inequality because people live you know, the problem of uh, economic inequality uh, that policymakers should look into because supposedly our migration program is a temporary measure during the 1970s. But what we have now is becoming like a permanent temporariness or a temporary permanence because uh, government said that this is still a temporary measure, but still, we have we are what like the model of uh, migration sending countries. Like Indonesia is following our footsteps. India is doing the same thing, coming up with uh, bureau on migration and employment, and um, that's that's what's happening now. No? We should also consider the effect, as mentioned a while ago by Sir Mayong of child left behind, or they call this stay behind uh, children, and the impact of mothers leaving, because mostly there's what we call a feminization of migration. When they leave, what happened to the children left behind? And that's where intervention should come in. Uh, for instance, in terms of you know e education and literacy, and the growing concern of, for instance, of uh, cardinal, uh, the question about secularization, you know, the children uh, left behind too, and the problem of gangsterism. So policy makers should also look into this, and interventions should come from all levels, and including the NGOs, like uh, Sir Maintana. Thank you very much, Andy. May we now have uh, Dudoy, please, for the final word? Before I pull out all our resource person and the secretary for a press conference on the other side. <laughs> yes, uh, Doyle? Comments land on uh, monitoring and evaluation. At the moment, we are closely working with the different uh, CSOs to equip them in terms of uh, applying the open data kit para sa real, pro uh, real time project monitoring. If uh, we are all familiar with the system, then we can provide very objective, real time. Uh, a feedback to our partners yeah, in government and in our uh, and, uh, donors or development partners. Uh, kailangan lang i-demystify, uh, yung i-simplify yung approach. 
which at the moment yung mga communities namin are already doing. Uh, comment lang doon sa cooperative, no? I've been into cooperative development for bata pa si Mayong. Anyway, uh, lalo na doon sa IP groups, no? One is uh, kailangan ng sustained accompaniment, no? Uh, example, we had an experience sa IP group nung uh, 32,000 pa sila, okay lang. Nung naging 7 million, naging 14, naging 42, okay pa. Nung 90, 92 million na sila, unti-unti nang lumalabas yung problema. Nung nag-160, malaki ng problema. 192 million, masyado na malaki yung problema. So kailangan ng third party, ay yung those who organize them, and merong credibility sa community, kailangan mong i-accompany yung communities para yung uh, yung corruption ay hindi papasok doon sa uh, doon sa uh, doon sa mga economic transactions ng cooperative kailangan lang i-institutionalize and we also realize that those cooperatives what were organized initiated by faith group organizations lalo yung galing sa simbahan uh, uh, cardinal uh, example, Tagum Co-op, uh, Nabunturan Co-op, Santa Catalina Co-op, started with uh, inspiration from the church. So yung values ay malakas. No? Pero kailangan lang na i-professionalize yung, yung management. Isa pang mali sa cooperative, though we are also advocating for the cooperative, yung leadership, no? we organized the... Davao Agricultural Federation of uh, Agricultural Cooperatives Federation, Daki Daku, who took over the buying and trading of uh, NFA no uh, uh, early 1990s. Yung 13 big cooperatives ay managed professionally, pero pina, pinasok nung political leader yung mga maliliit na cooperatives. Ay, one vote, one organization, one vote. So talo yung professional managers. Pag pinasukan yun ang political interest, talo na, talo na. No? Pag, uh, kaya baka pwedeng uh, i-improve yung policy in terms of uh, retention, selection and retention of officers and management staff. Otherwise, we will always be confronted with these issues and concerns in terms of how to sustain the uh, uh, professionalism in terms of uh, management of the cooperatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dudoy. Ang sabi ho nila, ang hamon ng kaunlaran ay hindi madali dahil kung ito ay madali, dapat ay nagawa na natin. Social dialogue is important, but dialogue is not enough to move the challenges that we have in Mindanao. What we need are collaborative efforts to transform Mindanao from a land of unfulfilled promises to a land of promise. We end our session on that note. Allow me to thank our speakers and our uh, discussants. Let's give them a warm applause. Thank you very much. And we thank each and everyone for joining us in the morning session. Yung mga hindi po na pagbigyan ng pagkakataon na makapagtanong ay mamayang hapon na lang po tayo babawi. Shira? Thank you very much.